Well, welcome to the Dan River Baptist Bible Study for January the 17th. Glad to have you with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I've heard it said that we may be the only Bible that someone may read. That's a, quite a burden to know that people are watching us all the time. So it's very important that uh, we live our life, that our walk is true and our, and our talk follows that walk. Uh, when you say you're a Christian, and we need to show it and demonstrate it, it's too important to let down. But not for show or not for any kind of gain, but just because it needs to be said. It's how, how did we learn about our salvation, but by someone else testifying for us. Let it be to win and others to Christ. Let others see Christ in us, for he is. His, his spirit embodied in, in, in us and part of us. For there are, after all, only two kinds of people in the world, lost sinners and saved sinners. Praise God for his indescribable gift that he's given to the world. May we share our testimony that reaches out to others that they will see that gift and receive it unto themselves. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, while I was preparing for uh, this lesson, I was turning through my Bible and lo and behold, I found this bookmark from uh, February 3rd, 2019, Baptist Men's Day. And on that day, I gave a uh, children's sermon, and uh, I wanted to have something very short they could remember, and I wanted to give them something that they could take with them. And so I had these bookmarks put up. But first of all, I said what was on the bookmark. I made a statement like this, no God, no peace. No God, no peace. And I said, uh, that sounds like I said the same thing, doesn't it? But I said, it, it, it's not the same. And I showed him the card, and it says, N-O, God, N-O, peace. No God, no peace. K-N-O-W, no God, no peace. And how I would say it if uh, someone were watching me and they couldn't read it, and I was just uh, dictating it, I'd say, I'd say it this way. I'd say, no God, no peace. No God, no peace. And that's not only peace, but joy and happiness and love and truth and all good things. If you know God, you'll know those. And my uh, message to them was to take as many of these cards, four or five of them, and to keep one. I wanted them to th be a kind of a testimony, to keep one and give all the others away to someone like their mom, their dad, or a friend, a school teacher. Put it in your uh, school books or your Bible where you'll see it from time to time and read it and get comfort from the truth that it tells you. Because this thing will always testify. You and I pass up opportunities. We'll say, uh, they're not ready to listen to me today, or I'm not quite ready to tell them about it. And we pass it up. There'll be another time. But sometimes that doesn't happen. But this little bookmark, if they look at it, it speaks to them. And that was uh, my goal, was to have those children take that bookmark. And I told them, I hope someday 
turn through a Bible or the book where you put it, and you'll run into it again. It may be old and faded by then, but you'll recall this message and what it meant, and I hope you've used it over and over, and God will smile down upon you. Thank you. Well, our lesson today is uh, created for a purpose. Question is, does God sometimes prepare a special person for a certain job uh, that he wants done? And the answer, I think, is yes. I can cite, for example, Jesus. He was a special birth. John the Baptist, same thing. Created for a purpose for God. Here in this study, that's what we're going to find out what God did with Jeremiah. Let's, let's read there in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. All of us at times wonder, what am I here for? What, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What is life all about? And you know, without answering that question or thinking about that question, you're, you're just existing. That's all we're doing. Without knowing God, we may never find out what he wanted us to do. So it's very important we try to find out what he wants us to do. I know for one thing, he wants us to testify. If you know Jesus, he wants you to testify about that and tell people how to be saved. That much we know. But it is more than just living and dying or working. I want you to think about this. Imagine yourself in a cemetery and you're looking at the gravestones and when you do that, invariably we look at the dates on the tombstone. When were they born? When did they die? That little space between or that dash sometimes they put there. You know what that is? That represents our life. We were born here. We died here. Our life must have happened in between there. What did happen? Is it more than a dash or more than a, spa a space? We know that life described in the Bible is, is a vapor. It's a mist. It evaporates fast. It's like water poured in the desert on the sand. It disappears quickly. It's like today's flower and tomorrow it's dead and dried up. So our life, even in the Bible, is termed to be a short span of time. Even if we were to live a hundred years, it's a blink of the eye in God's terms. Because what is a day to God? The Bible tells us a thousand years is the same as a day with God. I wanted you to think about that. It also, it seems to me, and I, I hope you as you think about uh, lives, and it seems like life is expendable. We hear every night how many deaths COVID has caused, and it's mounting up, heavy tolls. We also see uh, the, ability, uh, the killing of the unborn, and, and even the born, We've gone so far as doing that too. Who can or who will speak for them? They have no voice to complain. They haven't made it past, much past the womb of being born. There's no voice of complaint. A little people we hear complain at time to time, but it's silenced quickly. There's a church here, a local church, I believe it's a Christian church, not far from here, that one day I passed it. 
it sets back off the road and it's got a big field in front of it. The field looks to be about the size of a football field, 100 yards by 50 yards or so. And as I passed it one day, it was full of little flags about a foot high off the ground, spaced out, and it looked like it filled the whole field. And there they were, pink and blue flags. And I, was, well, I took a lot of time to do that. Uh, I didn't know what it meant at first. And after I passed it a couple of times, I, I slowed down and there was a little sign there that said that the flags represented uh, the children that are aboard it each day. And I don't remember the exact number. Well, it was over 2,000 a day. And I don't know, that just, that just hit me. That looked like such a, a mass of flags there that I just couldn't understand how we could do that. But that's this country. That's just this country. Untold how many it is around the world. The word of the Lord came to me. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. Before you were born, I, I sanctified you, set apart for a special purpose, to be a prophet unto the nations. Jeremiah never had to wonder about his life and what he would do. He had a job given to him by God called to, uh, by God for a special assignment. Exactly how Jeremiah learned of this assignment is not clear, not known. Did he hear a voice? Did he hear it in a dream or see it in a dream? Or was it a vision? All we know is he was formed and created, sanctified and ordained to be a prophet what plan, what, what was his assignment? He had an assignment to carry a message to the nations. And I don't just mean the, the countries, I mean every human being on earth at his time to reach the world with his message. Uh, all this was decided before he was born and brought into the world. Jeremiah was made for this purpose. Does God have some kind of purpose for you and me? I think he does. Uh, the Bible tells us everyone's got at least one gift. And uh, we don't. sometimes it takes us a while to find out what that gift is. Some have many gifts. But when we find out what our gift is from God... I think he wants us to use it, apply it, and give it back. So what, what is his calling for you and me? That's part of our learning. We have to try to find that out. But when, when you don't know, you just have to stumble along sometimes. And you know you want to do something for God, but you don't know what. So how do you do something for God? You know, people would jump at a chance if I said, hey, I got an assignment for you, and this is for God. God wants it done. And you say, boy, this is an important job. And what is it? Do something for somebody else. That's how you do something for God, is by doing something for somebody else. Because we're told in, in the judgment He'll say, you gave me a drink of water. You, you visited me in the jail or what, you fed me when I was starving. When did I do all that? In that you did it under the least of these. You did it under me. That's how we do something for God. Do it for somebody else. And you'll be doing it for God. Let's go on and read uh, back in Jeremiah Chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. 
But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. When I read these about God choosing special people, it seems to me invariably every time he picks one, they're not ready to do it. They're hesitant. They find some excuse why they shouldn't be the one. They're reluctant to take on the task. I'll throw out a couple of names and you'll see what I mean. Moses, he said, God said, I want you to go down to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. He said, I can't do that. I'm, I can hardly speak at all. I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech. I think after he argued with God a little while, God just said, there's Aaron. I know he can speak. You take him and let him speak and you do whatever else I tell you. And it all worked out. And I believe Moses did quite a bit of speaking when he got there, even though he said he couldn't. Uh, another example is Jonah. God had a, a task he wanted him to do is to go to Nineveh, a, a great city to the north, a Gentile city, God didn't want to see it be like a Sodom and Gomorrah that it had to be destroyed. So he wanted Jonah to go speak to him. But Jonah, he wanted nothing to do with Gentiles. So he went, instead of going north, he went the other way. And we know the whole story about him the, getting thrown into the sea and swallowed by a big fish and thrown up onto the bank near where he needed to go in the first place. But he ends up, since he's here, I'll go ahead and I'll deliver the message. But I'm going to deliver my message. I'm going to give the message that God told me to give him. So he went through the city. The city was a, a journey of three days, they said, meaning if you walked across it, it would take you three days. So that's what he did. He started walking across Nineveh, and all he did was say, in 40 days, this city will be destroyed, and everybody in it. That's his only message. He didn't offer. God wanted to save them. He didn't say, if you turn to God, this can all be avoided. He didn't want to say that. Just in 40 days, it's over. And he marched through the city saying that. And I think he was kind of enjoying that, saying that, uh, tell them they were going to be destroyed. Lo and behold, first thing he knew, everybody started repenting. The, uh, from the lowest peasant to the king, everybody started repenting. Even the king came out and made a demand you had to do that. If you had cattle, put ash cloth and uh, ashes on them and make even the cattle and the sheep be uh, de uh, dedicated to God. The whole city changed over and God spared the city. And the city, I think we said, was uh, six, six score thousand, 120,000 people and much cattle and things. And they were spared. And it irritated Jonah that that happened. He, I won't tell the rest of the story, but he was reluctant and still angry over it. And even though uh, Jeremiah was made for the test, God just told him you were made special from the womb for this job I've got for you to do. Even though that, he balked at it. He said, ah, oh, Lord, a no was coming. Sound like what the nominating committee here over and over around here. No, I'm not ready for that. Some other day, maybe check with me next year so we go without some jobs filled sometimes. He's, he also goes, I can't speak. He it sounds like Moses there, don't he? 
I'm a child, I'm like a child, not ready, not able. But God said unto him, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send you. Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. I will give you the message to share, and uh, you will deliver it. Do not be afraid of their faces. Maybe God saw that that was part of his problem, that he was a little backward, a little afraid of people, confronting people in their face, especially powerful people, the nations. But he says, I'm with you to deliver the saith the Lord. You would not be alone. I'll be with you. Let's jump on down to verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. The Lord touched his mouth, he said. And behold, I put it, he put his words in my mouth. Jeremiah didn't have to think about the message that he had to give. It was already there. He just had to open his mouth and it would come out like a recording. The message was the Lord's, it's, a, it's the attitude that Jeremiah took. It's his message. If they don't like it, they're rejecting God, not me. I got no dog in this fight, so to speak. Uh, he, he didn't have to worry about whether it was acceptable or not. He was trying to justify himself. If they reject it, they were rejecting the Lord. See, I have this day set you over nations and over kingdoms, not to rule these kingdoms or nations, but to change them. Your word would root out, uproot, break down and destroy and throw down. Seems like we need something like that nowadays. He was not being called to be popular, was he? Or well-liked. But in the end there, there was at the very tail end of his uh, direction from God, the command was not entirely negative. Uprooting, tearing down, destroying were not his final words. He then gave Jeremiah the charge to build and to plant and to begin all over again anew. You know, uh, each of us is not, we're not like a Jer uh, Jeremiah or anything like him. But God's given every Christian the ability to do something for him, to take on a task. He gives everybody a gift. I know it says that at least, everybody has at least one gift. Maybe it takes us a long time to find that gift. But then when we do, we're to put it to work. Uh, be, what do we know? For one thing, if you're a Christian, you know the way, the truth, and the life. We know all about Jesus. And we can tell that story. And that's, in fact, the way we learned. Somebody came to us and shared their testimony, most likely. It's how we learn, and we got converted. It might have been a preacher, it might have been someone in the family, however it was. We heard it from somebody else. And also, there's a place in the Bible that talks about by the foolishness of preaching. God said that, we didn't say that. He called it foolishness of preaching because that's how people looked at it. But through that, it's the power unto God to save. He decided to do it through preaching. Here's a question I want to ask you. 
Why are you left after you're saved? After you've given your life to Christ, why are you left on earth? Can you be more saved? No. You're saved. You can do more good, more works for God. But you can lead another to salvation and things like that. Is that possibly why we're left? I know also there are rewards. I can't think of a much better reward over being saved that you can get. But there are rewards on top of that. Degrees of it. But you can lead another salvation and that's maybe why we're here afterwards. I want to go on down and read uh, the last verse there. You see, I have this day set thee over the nations, over the kingdoms, to do all those things, to root it out, to destroy everything. But to build and to plant was the final word. That's what he wanted them to do. Uh, now, I want you to turn to in your Bibles, uh, but I want to call your attention to this scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Listen to these now closely. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall uh, inherit the kingdom of God. I want to stop right there. There's uh, one more to go, but I'm going to read that. Now. now, what I want you to think about, did you see your particular sin mentioned? If you didn't, you might have went, "Woo, I got by. They didn't name mine. But that's just an oversight. If it's not in there, I want you to write your sin in. Put your particular sin in this. With. But I believe that we didn't even have to do that because the very first one, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So that covers it all. But if you have a particular sin that you can name, don't say you escaped and you got out by this. It was meant to be all-inclusive. But now here comes the, the best part in verse 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Do you see what I mean by putting your sin in? Then it's excused. Thank God for that little word, but. And the other one that said, and such were some of you. That tells you that it doesn't matter what you've done. Everybody can be saved. We can think of people, can a Hitler be saved? It seems like impossible, but there's, there's a way he could. He can reach anyone. If he can save me, he can save anybody. Like I say, this is to be an all-inclusive. And I, I ask you, you may have something that you know is a sin. You, you carry it around. You feel guilty about it. Write it down in there or put it in mentally, however you want to do it so that you're included in his forgiveness 
of God. For all sins belong there. And that concludes my lesson. Hope to see you next time. Thanks for listening.